We just have a few questions. State your full name. Charles Francis Nicoletti. Do you own a bar? With my family, yeah. Have you ever worked with a foreign government? Have you been to Central America? Why did you overstay your visa? Who exactly has a few questions? Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Tran, Executive Director of Gold House. And I'm Michelle Sugihara, Executive Director of the Coalition of Asian Pacifics and Entertainment, or CAPE. We are excited to be joining you all today to discuss ABC's new thrilling heist drama series, The Company You Keep. Based on the Korean format, My Fellow Citizens, The Company You Keep begins with Charlie, a con man, and Emma, an undercover CIA officer, meeting at a bar and unknowingly ending up on a collision course, both romantically and professionally. While Emma is investigating the woman that holds Charlie's family's debts in her hands, her family is working to build a political dynasty. We are pleased to have the Hill family here with us today, including the brilliant undercover CIA operative Emma, played by Catherine Hannah Kim, the charming beloved former politician Joe, played by James Saito, and the unstoppable politically savvy matriarch Grace, played by Frida Foshen. Unfortunately, Tim Chu, who plays the charismatic state senator and golden boy of the family, David, is no longer available to join us today, but he sends his regards. We're also so honored to have executive producer John M. Chu joining us today. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh well, Jeremy and I absolutely love the series. We were fortunate enough to watch through the first four episodes, and we're so excited to be here. But for any new viewers joining us today, we'd love for you to share a bit more about your characters and what drew you to them. Let's start with Catherine, James, and then Frida, and then we'll have other questions for John. Ah, uh, gosh, so many things drew me to this part. I've been calling it my dream role ever since the first read. I think anytime we can see all different kinds of people on screen, just being human, the better, the more we'll get to see how similar we all are and also how uniquely different. And I feel like you have this fully fleshed out Asian American protagonist who's just navigating life and love and work as I think we all are. And that's probably what drew me the most. James, how about you? Uh, what drew me most to the character is his uh, where he is in society, uh, that he's worked hard, the immigrant story, uh, that he's you know made a success out of himself in America and the stature that he's reached and the love of his family. Uh, that's something that I wanted to portray and that I think is important for Americans to are for America to see us with Asian faces as American as anyone else. And you, Frida? I, I totally uh, am with my husband there. Uh, I think what, you know, what really um, brought me to this script was that we are, this script is not what is still worth telling, which is the immigrant story, the assimilation stories, those particular stories that center upon being Asian American. What I love about this script is that we are American first, ethnic second, and that it, you know, it is something that allows us as participants to learn in it. For instance, you know, this is a, um, I think this is a first in terms of being a multiverse, if we want to say that, um, of Asians, because we have a Korean father and we have a Chinese mother. And the children will have grown up with dual uh, cultural backgrounds. And it was so interesting to me because we encountered that in our very first um, scene, practically, that we shot. Uh, I had a question about hanbok, which is, I learned, a Korean traditional outfit. I didn't know that before. So being in this allows me not only to give our audience uh, further knowledge about different Asian cultures, it allows me to educate myself 
and to progress in that. And Catherine was just wonderful in allowing me to stumble through what Hanbach was, how to pronounce it, what it would mean for my son to wear that politically, et cetera. It was, it was wonderful. And that is that is what drew me to this project. That's, uh, that's a reality of today's uh, mm -hmm. world, right? Frida, we're all kind of mixed and multicultural in many ways. So it's, it's such a beautiful thing to see something like that reflected on screen. And John, how about you? What drew you to the series? Well, for me, what well, Kaylin, uh, my head of TV, sort of brought this to me. She knew that we were looking, you know, the projects that we look for are projects uh, that, um, I don't know, redefine identity, uh, but also very entertaining, have sort of spectacle and meaning all at the same time. That's entertainment first, and yet has uh, something relevant to say. And for me, um, when she brought it to me, what was exciting was that it was just a very entertaining, exciting show. And then the second thing that fascinated to me about it was it's about lies and identity. And, you know, we live in Hollywood, we work in Hollywood where lies are everywhere. And I'm 43 years old and I have four kids now. And I lie to my kids every day about the way I want the world to be and what I think it is. And then I think back at my parents um, who I grew up in the Bay Area. My parents are immigrants from China and Taiwan and, and all the lies they told me uh, that in a way, sometimes they had to convince themselves of, of America, uh, of the American dream in order to survive. And in a way, it really helped me. In a way, it really allowed me to be naive and believe that the best of people are out there and, and go for my dreams and then live through the turmoil that you realize when, oh no, that place doesn't actually exist. It's a idea that we're all fighting for. And so I love that this got to sort of uh, handle that in an entertaining way. And, and the Hill family reminds me of my family in a lot of ways. My parents, as I say, in almost everything, as they, they own a restaurant. I grew up in a Chinese restaurant um, and yet is a pillar of the community. The, the restaurant's still there 53 years later. And my dad um, uh, is like, David, he he. People respect him, and my mom is very much like Grace, where she is uh, the muscle behind it all, and she taught us, and both of them taught. And there was always a struggle, but of, of how traditional or American we need to be, and but they taught us how to play the game, um, and how to act. And while that is great for maybe a generation or half of your, you know, part of your life, there is a part that then you have to be who you really are, and you have to actually re-examine your own identity. And that's what I love about the Hill family. Throughout the series, they're going to discover that identity and discover that what where the truth lies, which may be in between somewhere. Um, and even my family's restaurant, which you know ha has been, um, people have said, "Oh, well, you know, it's like Americanized Chinese food or whatever." And yet, it's true to my parents. And so, and I'm, oh, that John is like the whitest Asian dude we know. And so, for me, those kind of comments. Uh, uh, probably didn't affect me more when I was younger, but now affect me more than ever because I am who I am. And um, and so I think that the the struggles of these characters are, are in line with that. I'm excited to be able to explore that with these great actors who who give it humanity and I'm sure have all their own journeys that that inform this. And so that that's what drew me closest to to this project. Well, speaking of families and lies, this question is for anyone who would like to jump in. The series draws parallels between the two families, the Hills, who we talked about, and then the Nicolettis. How would you describe their similarities and differences? Well, I think it's interesting, right? Because you have the Nicolettis who are arguably the have-nots and you have the Hills that are the haves. And sometimes we always wanna root for the underdog, you know, especially because you have this family of grifters and the Nicolettis who only steal from people who are quote unquote undeserving. But you look at the Hill family and they actually don't come from money. They, they built this family and their success and their wealth with the sweat on their, their backs uh, because Grace's family was wealthy and actually they didn't approve of Joe because he wasn't wealthy and he wasn't Chinese and she chose love uh, and chose to be with him. So they've created this political dynasty all on their own and now their children get to reap the benefits of it. And I think that's something really exciting. I think in a way that is the American dream. It's it's this idea that you can come here and it doesn't matter if you have or don't, everyone's on equal playing field, you know, in the sense that if you're willing to work hard enough, you get to reap the benefits. 
and you get to have safety here and home here and you get to have a good life for your family and yourselves. Amazing. Anyone want to add to that? Well, I think also, um, uh, you know, mentioning love, I think that uh, that is one place where both families are really uh, similar, which is that the parents have a very strong personal bond and the siblings have a very strong personal bond. And it, it what they do is somewhat reflective of um, similar values in terms of, you know, we, we navigate through the political world because what we want is to make a better society. I mean, Joe and I, right, Joe? <laughs> and um, the Nicolettis, as Catherine pointed out, they grift, but they only grift their Robin Hoods, in other words. So that kind of similarity is something that um, I think when, when I meet Charlie, it's something that I feel in him and that I know will be a connection for um, my daughter. Um, just on a side thing, uh, with, for the Nicolettis in the Hills, I noticed that the sons both follow in the father's line of business. And it's arguably true that the daughters are the smartest persons in the families. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna argue with that, so. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> well, speaking of relationships between the family, I think Emma is often seen as the black sheep of her family. And in episode two, she reveals to David that she works for the CIA. Um, why does she trust him with this information? And how does her relationship with him contrast with her relationship with their parents? I think that they've always been really close. I think maybe as their adult years have passed, they've grown apart only because of distance, being across the country from each other. But David is definitely that one person who always tells it to her as it is. And, uh, and I think they always root for each other. Um, I don't think she takes it lightly that he's been the golden child of the family and all of the pressures and expectations that comes, comes with that kind of role. Uh, and also I think things just came to a head very quickly where now they're living back in the same household again and he's asking for her advice. I mean, she's the younger sister and he wants her advice on, um, on how to run his campaign. And she doesn't know how to lie to him in that, in that opportunity. I think that um, for Joe, I was so caught up with my work and trying to succeed in this world that I sort of neglected the kids and how much Grace was responsible for raising the kids and how much I wasn't there to really spend time. I get a sense that um, David and Emma had each other when they were growing up. And that closeness is part of why maybe at, at this point in time, they can reconnect and she'll confide something as, as deep as that to her brother because they've, been, they've had to struggle together all these years. I also think it's interesting that for, for, for me, what gets me excited is I, you know, I come from a family of five and my older brother, my oldest brother, who's only six and a half years older than me, uh, was sort of the confidant for all of us, all the younger siblings. Um, he had to, he, he he had more of the the baggage of my parents uh, and 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 my parents, my mom who had you know who's one of six. They all moved here from China, and so to he felt the pressure, the more of the pressure of the immigrant uh, sort of expectations of him than I did, and so and he was sort of more of a of a father in a you know guidance way than my my actual father, he, you know, he's the one who taught me how to drive. He's the one who taught me how to dribble a basketball. My dad was in the restaurant. So I just love that 
that kind of relationship is that I see between um, David and Emma are just is is just uh, very familiar to me, and I and I love that we get to put that on 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 TV for on network TV for everyone to see. Wanted to pivot a little and talk about the theme of crime and punishment, and wondering how we'll see that play out with the Hills family's political affairs. Can you share? without giving too much away. Oh, I really, uh, you know, that's a difficult question because I think that is, uh, it's a spoiler alert. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know that we can venture into that, but maybe uh, others in the family will have a way to navigate that. I think we all have <laughs> secrets and a lot of times we try, you know, we we are hoping that we can move on and, you know, that it's just a part of our life, but sometimes it comes back and rears its ugly head. Well, going back to what John was saying, right, with lies uh, and, and the idea of identity, it's interesting because I feel like once you start lying, you have to keep up the lie and they just start snowballing. And at some point it's gonna catch up to you, like James is saying, you can't keep secrets hidden forever. And so what's gonna be interesting about our show is the truths are gonna come out. They're actually gonna come out way faster than you will expect them to. Um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting. I think it's really interesting because we just finished filming the finale this past week. And it made me reflect that nobody in the finale is who you meet in the pilot every single character goes through their own journey which is really interesting of growth and change and facing lies and facing truths and uh it'll be i think interesting for for people to see how everyone navigates it all exciting that is a great chapter <laughs> Congratulations on finishing uh, and wrapping up. Um, speaking of which, we have some questions from, from some fans, and I think everyone wanted to know what were some fun behind the scenes stories you have in filming the series? Why don't we start with Frida? You, you, you laughed the most, so do you have a good one to share? Oh my God, no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> I, I had um, one where uh, we, uh, I was, uh, going into someone's office <clears throat> and um, we'd gotten the take, you know, uh, what was needed. And I asked the director for one more take. And um, when I was going into this office, I was not expected in the office. So the receptionist was following me saying, you know, um, excuse me, uh, I'm sorry, you can't go in there. And um, I just wanted to do one more take where, as the person was following me, I just ignored that person and just went to them, which elicited a laugh in the video village. But that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Whether it makes it or not into the cut, I don't know, but it was fun for, you know, for us doing the takes. I love that. How about you, James? Uh, okay, um, I don't really have a story, but I'll just throw this in as a contribution. Um, the hills live in such a stratosphere that is so above my my you know place in life. And when we were uh, the prop guys, all the the crew is fantastic. Everybody's so on top of things. So when we were uh, getting watches and different props and things the the prop man opened up a suitcase and there were just you know they're they're knockoffs but just beautiful beautiful watches and for me i saw a rolex and i thought oh rolex that's what i want and uh and the prop man said how about this one and it was this leather i don't even know the name of it but it's this leather watch he said this one's something like $125,000. And I said, oh, okay, I'll take that one. And <laughs> David wears the Rolex. So it's like, that's that's where these people live. And, and I just thought, 
wow, I guess I got to get used to having my head in that space. <laughs> um, I wish that Tim was here because he's such a joy to work with. And he and I probably geek out the most out of anyone in this family, just about all these scenes that only happen in our minds that actually aren't on screen, you know, all in between all the scenes, like um, just the scenes where we get to have honest conversations and really root for each other. And I don't want to give away what happens in the later episodes, but um, but yeah, uh, I, I think just having that space to play and be spontaneous together has just been the most fun out of anything. And also the fact that, I mean, you know, like I'm a first generation immigrant here too, or, or my parents are uh, immigrants. So I'm the first generation born here. And my dad was an engineer in Korea. My mom, she did admin at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but they spoke no English. They got here to New York and they were peddling whatever they could at flea markets. At one point they were selling umbrellas in Times Square. And now we have these like multi-block building long digital ads in the exact same place. And for me as an actor, it's just the most surreal feeling ever. That's absolutely incredible. And Tim, I've been yeah. tracking for so long because Tim um, auditioned for Crazy Rich Asians and was one of the, was one of the final people uh, to play Nick. Um, he was uh, way too American. <laughs> in a way to play Nick. Uh, but I always was like, this guy is a really good actor. I knew a lot of people who went to school with him and was in like theater uh, a group with him. And so I was always tracking him. So it was really fun to be like, oh, I know the perfect uh, one for David here. And and then, and Catherine I met um, in our audition process and it was just so great to, to have that. And I remember the, when we were shooting the pilot, and this is a silly story, but I, I okay, was coming a little late to this hotel in downtown LA. And so I saw all this like production set up where I thought we were all shooting. And so I go in and it's everyone in period costumes. And I thought like, wait a minute, they made yeah. crazy choices in this costume that I was not aware of. This is very strange. And it ended up, they, they were having like a Bridgerton dinner party or something. Yes. And it was right next to our set and they were blasting music and it was like the hardest place to shoot. But I remember being like, did our production go crazy and suddenly choose different costumes? But and it, was, it was quickly clarified <laughs> when I thought gathered and Milo in the sickest, <laughs> sexiest outfit. So I was relieved. Bridgerton crossover. I'm excited for that. <laughs> we yes. know we made it when, when, they, when they have a company you keep dinner party uh for, for fans that's what we know <laughs> really fun we have another fun audience question here and to Catherine's point about how by the finale the characters aren't what they were like in the pilot this question is asking which character are you most like in real life knowing that the best characters are layered and nuanced Or if you want to take the opposite side, which character are you the least likely, like in real life? I mean, I'm going to argue that I'm most and least like Emma. I'm most like her in that uh, I'm also very curious. I'm very curious about important things like what I'm going to have for lunch tomorrow. She's curious about, you know, how does someone what drives somebody to do this? How did we get here? How do we prevent this from ever happening again? And I feel like in a world where we love to overshare about everything, and listen, I get it, because sometimes you get a salad and it is just beautiful and you need people to know. But um, if Emma does her job right, just like every CIA officer that she is hopefully representing and doing justice by, um, nobody will ever know. And she makes a point to be invisible in such an oversaturated world. And that I think is really interesting. Um, I think there are a lot of elements of Joe Hill that uh, I have uh, that, especially when he was younger, 
you know, because um, when he was working his way through uh, politics and trying to get somewhere, I, I can see that that's how I felt about acting all my life. You know, I've been doing it for 48 years and it's the focus, the main focus. And I've sacrificed relationships and um, comfort to just pursue it and do the best I could. So I believe, uh, you know, Joe has succeeded in, in his way. And, you know, we have that same drive. I have to say, uh, uh, I'm probably um, like Catherine, that I feel both strong affinity and also very different from my character, Grace. I think we, um, we grew up somewhat similar, like um, uh, not at the same you know, uh, financial level, but my parents did manage um, to send me to a prep school. I went to one in Massachusetts, and then I went on to an Ivy League type college. And um, unfortunately, I never met my Joe Hill at the college. And I have a very strong interest in uh, politics and how political things get done. My first serious boyfriend was uh, the son of an assistant chamber of um, assistant commerce secretary in Washington, DC. So I hung out in DC a lot. Um, and my in later in life, my uh, a very serious love interest was the son of a state governor. Um, not Washington, but um, a different one in the middle of the country. Um, so there's a lot about her and the campaigns and how she wants to um, do, do things for the country and for the world that are close, close to my heart. Uh, what is alien to me is... Um, certain parts about how she drives her children. That, and I don't know if that's because I'm not a mother, so I don't really um, know what it means to, to really want your children to have grandchildren. It, it, it's something that I have been exploring in the character, which is of interest. And that whole thing about a a familial legacy or dynasty um, is something that's quite different. And I think Grace has a, um, an assertive confidence that I don't really have as a person. I mean, and as an actor, I, I tend to go into my characters from a very different uh, point of view. Um, whereas I feel like she would do things differently. For instance, uh, you know, like um, I was once playing a, um, a character who was an immigrant mother. And at a certain point in the rehearsal process for this film, I had um, felt like she'd become part of me. So I asked her, where would you like to go? We have an afternoon, where would you like to go? And I thought, as a, this was back in New York City, I thought as an immigrant mother, she would want me to go to Chinatown, that she would want to go down there. And instead, she took me to Bloomingdale's. And I was like, what, why do you want to go to Bloomingdale's? And what she said to me was, because my daughters are going to go here and they will feel that this is where they belong. I don't feel that, but I want them to feel that. And this is where I want to go. And I was shocked. And I expect that at a certain point, you know, uh, in terms of exploring grace, that I will say the same thing to her. And she too will surprise me with where she's going to take me. Wow. We have time for a couple last questions. Um, so I'll go and then Michelle, you can ask the last question after that. 
we're coming off of a historic week for the Asian American community mm -hmm. at the Oscars and beyond. Um, how does this multicultural family in particular, their presence on network TV, contribute to the larger conversation about Asian, Amer Asian American representation on screen? Um, it's such a powerful thing to see people who look like you on screen being relatable and aspirational. And John, I think it was something I saw on your IG that you posted uh, where it was something along the lines of, I can't wait till um, this isn't newsworthy anymore because it's such a commonplace thing because it happens so much. And I think the goal hopefully is to tell stories that have never been told before. And, and if we keep doing that and keep adding to the collective human story, we, yeah, we will see how connected we all really are and how different we are. And that's something to be celebrated too. Yeah, and I, I, I feel like uh, this, our series in particular, is really going to advance um, the Asian American stories that we tell in this country and an opportunity for an Asian American generations, both, both the everywhere from grandparents down to toddlers to see their faces in us on the screen, on the small screen, which is a much more um, maybe relatable medium in some ways than the big screen. And I think it's uh, especially important on a day when we are also looking at the other side of the Asian American presence in America with the shootings that happened in Monterey Park and all the tensions that surrounded that. And with President Biden coming to, to recognize that and to acknowledge the um, tensions that exist in the Asian American community. And I think that's important too. And those stories will also get told. <clears throat> um, I, I, on top of what uh, the ladies have said is that, yeah, I, I agree. The more times that Asian faces are on screen in front of uh, uh, America it is wonderful. And it's great that we are being presented in such a dignified way, in such a fun show, uh, you know, just a marvelous production to be involved with. But in, in terms of the culture, you know, the cross culture of say the Chinese and the Korean, I, I started thinking, well, there are Italians who are married to, you know, uh, Irish people, or, you know, there are Dominicans who are with Puerto Rico, you know, and so within the Asian community, the, the Korean, you know, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, whatever, Filipino, whatever, Vietnamese, we all, a lot of times we find each other within just being Asian too. And it's wonderful that we can bring that and it doesn't have to necessarily be that, oh, this is a particular Asian story, a Chinese story, a Korean family story, a Japanese, you know, it, we're, we're Asians and this is what we look like. And uh, I, I think that that's helpful. And I love listening to this amazing cast talk about it. It just reminds me, you know, when I was, uh, I don't know, 11 years old, I was, there was literally a gift from the heavens that happened to me that I didn't, had no idea at the time. I was cast in this because they had no other Asian kids that would audition for this uh, professional local production of Pacific Overtures. Oh. And Mako was in it. And I was the boy in the tree. It's a song. Ah. Oh. And I literally was 10, 11 years old. No idea. Never been in anything other than like little school productions. And suddenly I was surrounded by Asian excellence on all sides of me. Um, dancers, singers, actors, legends at such a young age. And I was the kid and they took care of me. They took care of me when I messed up my lines on, uh, on stage, which is why I never performed again because it traumatized me, but um, in, in front of a thousand people. Oh, it's another totally another story. But they protected me. 
they they taught me things that I'd never known. They showed me when we you know when we would all go out for cast dinners or parties, they'd always invite me and and I was surrounded by a group of people that I looked up to in all sorts of ways. I had no idea the the profound nature and and also Mako himself, um, such a legend. The way he carried himself, he was a star, like proper star, and. That stayed with me my whole life, never fully like understanding what it, how it rearranged my brain until really doing Crazy Rich Asians and having that feeling again of like, oh wait, we can all eat, you know, Asian lunches and no one's saying, oh, noodles again, oh, dumpling, like everyone's like, hell yeah. Like there was a sense of community that was just so beautiful. And so, and, and by the way, I, I, my, my parents, I love television. I mean, I'm named Jonathan. My sister's name is Jennifer after Jennifer and Jonathan Hart from a TV show called Heart to Heart. And so TV has had a huge impact on my family and their way they see themselves in America. So to have a show like this on network television with a family like this that is classy, respectable, complicated in all the ways, um, and to have a cast that speaks as elegantly as this that can continue to inspire others who were um, maybe never seeking this or never thought they could, to me, normalizing that idea that this is a pathway only increases the amount of talent that we'll get, only increases the amount of storytellers that feel like it's possible to make. And so a show like this um, reaches the masses. And 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 so I, um, I you know what they say, they say you can't, um, you can't force anyone to change, but never underestimate the power of planting a seed. And I think all the all the seeds that we plant, and Cape is great at this because you have relationships in all tech and fashion and food and entertainment. Um, that we're all we all have a role in this. Uh, big, small, independent movies, big, gigantic movies. We all have a role in 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 showing what we can do. Um, and normalizing Asian excellence. And I think that, that the show like this um, it allows uh, one piece of the puzzle to be done that, like that and, uh, and hopefully many more. Oh, I, I just want to give a, um, a shout out to that generation, you know, Mako, Suntek, um, mm. Alvining, uh, all of those guys. Yeah. Uh, Overtures was the first uh, job I ever had in New York. So I knew Mako very well. Wow. And um, yeah, it, it was astonishing. And to, I felt the same as you. I mean, I didn't know how rare it was, but mm. to be surrounded by all of these Asians who were so excellent and who not only performed brilliantly every night, but were real people who squabbled mm. during the daytime, who, you know, did, uh, did all sorts of uh, funny things, et cetera. It was such a uh, eye opener for me. And it, it is so true, John, you never know uh, who you're gonna plant a seed with. For instance, uh, just recently, I found out that Josh Groban, who is opening in Sweeney Todd on Broadway, yeah. the seed for his love of Sondheim in Sweeney Todd was planted in when he came to see our production of Sweeney Todd at East West. Wow. He sat there, I think he was like 13, and wow. he said he just was mesmerized. So there you have a non-Asian who was tremendously affected by this uh, Asian-American production. I mean, we were, we were all Asian-Americans and directed by the wonderful Tim Dang. Mm. And then, you know, the other thing I, have to, I also have to give a shout out to Julia, because I had always, when I started as an actor, I'd always believed that the foundation for us not only was uh, Mako's generation, but it was it was going to be the writers. They were the ones who were going to make this plant bloom, because we actors can only enact what's on the page. And I have to give a shout out to Julia Cohen as a non-Asian for creating such wonderful Asian characters and for making that part of her story. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was surprising to me and mm -hmm. wonderful. 
And she was very collaborative in all of that. She would run things by me, say, hey, tell me about your family. Give me the dynamics about your family. And oh, we got in it. We got in it. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's fun to have somebody who's open and, and willing to hear it out. Or if I saw something in the script, and I'm sure we all have that ability. And when we read read an episode and be like, you know what, that's that's sort of weird if we treat it. That's not actually how our family would deal with it. And it gets more interesting. The story gets more interesting. So yeah. I, I agree with that. And same, it's like when the idea came about to turn the hills into a half Chinese, half uh, half Korean family, she she wanted my opinion on it and genuinely wanted it, which is exciting. This whole process has been really collaborative from top to bottom. And what John and Frida were saying, I mean, just to piggyback on that, I think we are all affected by what we take in on our screens way more than we ever think, right? And in some ways it does a disservice if we certain if we see certain characters in a one dimensional capacity. Like if we only see them being the techie or the sassy best friend, we just think all the people that they're supposed to represent are like that, which is not true. And I think that's what's so exciting about this family. You just get to see them be fully three dimensional people navigating everything together. Amazing. I love this conversation about planting seeds. I feel like that's always what I do. And when people ask me sometimes what I do, I say I'm a farmer and I just plant all these seeds. And I, I love what this show is sowing. All right. So the last question. In episode four, Charlie meets Emma's family. And what can you tease about their impression of Charlie? and how this will affect their relationship going forward? Uh, well, <laughs> um, um, I'm trying not to give too much away, but, but uh, when, when I meet Charlie, I feel very much like he's a kindred soul. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that has, relates to the idea of uh, grifters, being like politicians and uh, both of them wanting something uh, you know con people wanting something in a certain way and being able to be alert to what's happening in the room around you and that's one of the first things i notice with uh, charlie when i uh, meet him and get him off on my own that he is terrific at working the room at understanding people at um you know figuring out what what they're about and i think that gives me a certain reassurance in terms of how he's going to be with my daughter i know that he will be sensitive to the things that uh, are important to her and that he will see those so i like him for her yeah. Oh. I think what's so interesting <laughs> is uh, just in life, nobody is ever going to fit into one neat box, right? Everyone is way more complicated than what they seem at first glance. And uh, and certainly nobody on the show is exactly what you think they're going to be. Nothing is what you think it's going to be. And so I think people are going to be confused and and interested in how Grace and Joe react to jo, uh, to Charlie because it's not what you think is going to happen or what you assume they would if that makes any sense it's they don't react the way you think they will I guess I should say um without giving away too much uh I I there are a lot of aspects of Charlie that I'm immediately impressed by but i can see that i am an overly protective and kind of maybe a bit closed-minded when it comes to my daughter and her relationships so i'm not as open-minded or receptive to charlie as as perhaps i could be just on facts that i get but all that's to be determined later. Excellent tease. 
Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us in this really fun conversation. Um, appreciate the time. Good to see you all. Uh, new episodes of The Company You Keep air Sundays at 10, 9 Central on ABC and are available to stream the next day on Hulu. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank and thank you for all the work that you guys do for our community. Yes, yes, thank you for all your work you do. It's wonderful. I did want to um, add one last thing, you know, um, I had this quick conversation actually with John when we were at the, the dinner after we wrapped the pilot and I was feeling a certain excitement, but I don't know if pressure is the right word because I wanted this production to be great and this character and this family to be great. And so I was putting a lot of pressure on myself and making it probably a little precious. And John reminded me that I'm one person and this is one story. And that's what it's supposed to be. He was like, you can, first of all, as me, Catherine, do as much or little as I choose to. And sometimes I think we forget that it's all a choice. Um, but, you know, I think this story isn't perfect because there is no perfect. I think that it's one story that there is a lot of attention and care being put into um, that will be added to the overall story. That's right. Brick by brick, right? And I love that you said that, Catherine, too, because I feel like that's everyone coming into this next generation of performers and feel a, a weight of what it means. And, and I think that that, uh, uh, I think that, that lifting that weight off everybody and saying, we're all here together. That's what Kate is so good at. A goal house is so good at saying, hey, we, we're all here. We're all doing work and we'll continue to work and you're gonna have a community behind you to support you is just such a huge life raft to have uh, for this next chapter for all of us, 100%. Cape was always there for me when I was barely getting jobs and I was barely trying to get like some sort of representation on screen and, and Cape was always there to have a community to say like, keep going, keep going. And if, if that's what we can do as a group here and say, do your work, do the best work, work on your craft, don't work on the other stuff, just work on your craft. I, I think that, that that speaks enough, that's enough. I think that's, 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 that's good for the next generation to just get better and better. And I think it's so, hmm. so exciting as organizations like Cave, movies like John, yours with Crazy Rich Asians, it's opening doors wider and wider. and. Uh, and it's actually growing the table that we all get to now sit at. You know, it's not like there are only a limited number of seats and you have to fight for them. It's like, come join me at the table. Let's see what we can create together. And that's what's really exciting. And James and Frida, you were there uh, before all the, uh, yeah. the, the stuff has been happening. And so you guys paved away so many, in, in so many ways. And we look up to you. So just have you as an honor on, on, on the show. Well, yeah, but you knocked the wall down. <laughs> you knocked the wall down, man. So you really opened it. Yeah. Thank you. I do. I do feel that. Uh, you know, it is so uh, exciting to me at this point. It used to be. I mean, first of all, Mako's whole generation who came, and you know, there were so few of them, and they gathered in little rooms, etc. Whether it was in New York or L.A. And then my generation that came and we saw what they had and we were able to learn from them and enter into the field. But we still knew every single actor and director and writer's names. We knew them all because there was such a small number. Now, uh, the, the actors in my generation, when we get together, we're like, we don't know anybody because there's so many. It's wonderful. It's just like, a, a thrilling to me and I feel as if we have so much to celebrate I mean thanks to all of you it is just uh it, it is really a thrilling moment at just at this particular juncture a thrilling moment for Asian American representation what you know for anybody of Asian descent the, what happened at the Oscars the the spread of the stories over all the media it is really um yeah Unbelievably wonderful. It's cool to be Asian. <laughs> yes, yes. 
Fifteen dollar, uh, you know, uh, dumplings on uh, in a roadside uh, <laughs> food truck. So. We used to dump those in the trash can before I got to school. Now, and people are paying premium prices for it. So, Ugh. awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. It was so wonderful. Thank you for the time. Get some sleep, John. <laughs> thank you. Yeah.